everyone, it's May 13th, 2017, and this is your episode 97 of Ep Percussion. I'm your host, Casey Cangelosi, and with me are some of the usuals, Ben Charles. Hi, everybody. How's it going, Ben? I'm doing well. We had our graduation today. Got my fancy cap here, so... <laughs> <laughs> nice. Excellent. Ben, did you know that tomorrow is Lou Harrison's 100th birthday? It's also uh, his mother's 100th Mother's Day. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah that was good clever <laughs> very clever did you guys plan that in advance no. <laughs> <laughs> no i didn't expect him to be that quick and from the sub list is tracy wiggins how's it going buddy uh, it's going well we also had graduation today um i got to sit in the cap and gown and look all cute and everything it was great nice and <laughs> here let me just uh <laughs> Oh, shoot. Let me make sure I do this right. And we have something of a new member on the show now. That was a drum roll. I don't know if you guys can hear that. (laughs) (laughs) Doctor announcing for the first time publicly, (laughs) Dr. Megan Arns. Wow, that was such an impressive introduction. Paul was just talking about how high-tech the show is. (laughs) Right. <laughs> it just sounded like white noise. Zero I'm flattered, though. Yeah. Thank you. We also had graduation today. Not my graduation, but I'm in Chicago, so I did not attend, unfortunately. Wow. I will be attending my graduation for the drum roll announcement next weekend. <laughs> I don't. I don't know that the graduation is going to seem like that cool of an event now that you've had that drum roll. I know. That's the can high you send high me high. the drum roll so I can take it with me? To I probably better, like, yeah. Company. Show them, make an improvement to graduations <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, that would be best. Well, you guys, look, our guest today is a principal lecturer at the University of North Texas. He and his wife, Sandy, are percussion coordinators and arrangers at Santa Clara Vanguard and have a long list of championships and awards with the UNT Drumline Phantom Regiment and the Vanguard. It's a, uh, let's see... It's great to so have now, now it's, it's uh, a assistant professor. Oh, thank Ooh. You. Oh, yeah. okay. Those IP That's guys, awesome. they got to update. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I saw I saw I the guess... job listing like a year or two ago. I was like, are they firing Paul? <laughs> <laughs> Glad they didn't. Cool. cool. That's awesome. Assistant Congrats, professor. But hey, please welcome to the show, you guys. Paul Rennick is with us today. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Good to be here. Yeah, sure. So what's about to happen for you, Paul? I, you told us you were writing music till the early morning last night. What's happening? You know, um, I I write only probably five or for five or six groups total. But the worst part about it is that they're all basically at the same time. Mm-hmm. They all, like all of them want um, music at the exact same time. So... Um, the times when a lot other people are really busy, I'm not, I'm not that busy. Uh, like in the fall, I don't really have a whole lot of writing at all to do, but right now, like the month of, uh, I guess the months of March, April, and May are pretty, pretty rough. Mm. Cause it's just like five deadlines at the same time. But yeah, I, I work for a, a couple of groups in Japan and then, uh, three drum corps over here and that's that's really about it so do you uh do you write the unt music yeah i do um you know it depends every year is a lot different um it you know sometimes we sort of recycle some things that i can just freshen up and make new again or rearrange uh and then sometimes the graduate assistant uh, does does uh, a fair amount of work, but there's usually one show. It's it's a it's a group that does. Uh, I want to say probably like three shows throughout the season, and I write typically write the first one, and then the the TAs or graduate students write the rest of them. Gotcha. Can you can you talk a little bit about cool. for those of us who are unaware what? What exactly are you writing when you write a show? Um, it, it's, it's it's a little different for every group, I think. Um, Santa Clara Vanguard. I'm the the music coordinator, so uh, I'm involved 
heavily in, in the actual construction of the music in terms of form and and choices of music it's a it's a team of people that consists of myself my wife and jd shaw we've been working together for probably 13 or 14 years um pretty steadily for that long so um that that's officially my role but we've been working together for so long that it's it's a little more casual than that and we can we communicate on a regular basis but um like for example, at the University of North Texas, I'll write uh, everything that the the group does, in, including the, the all the visual stuff as well, all the keyboard stuff, all the percussion stuff, all the drill. At, at Santa Clara, I coordinate the music. Um, Sandy and I write the percussion stuff together, and then uh, I usually uh, we have three kids, so um, Sandy is no longer able to 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 go see the group as much as possible as we used to. So at camps, I'll, I'll do a lot of, um, you know, I'll come back with the score all filled with red ink and sort of do a yeah. lot of, do a lot of, uh, composing and arranging right there at the camp. Uh, and then, uh, for these other groups, those are the two main groups that are really hands-on. The other groups are not hands-on are, are a lot more, uh, you never know, you know, I kind of write the stuff and it, it goes away and you don't know what happens to it. <laughs> you know, you'll hear a recording sometime in the future and, uh, you know, it, it, it it's kind of out of your hands, as you guys probably know. Once you write it, that's it. You, you kind of let it go. And um, so it, it'll either Sandy and I will sit down and talk about it. I'll usually coordinate it and kind of explain the form and kind of give give certain parameters and make make everything clear as to what's supposed to happen and then there's a certain amount of freedom within that and then we just sort of typically with the other groups you, you kind of write to what the brass arranger does so you're, you're kind of your hands are a little bit tied uh, the other groups are totally open you know it you know the length of the percussion things will um will vary quite a bit, you know, to whatever I think sounds good or whatever it needs more of or less of. But, uh, you know, I, there's, there's some of the groups I don't even ever hear, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a not really that I'm going to say not, not that much fun, you know, so to write it, you hand it off and you never really hear it again. So, um, that's typical with like the groups in Japan where I won't ever, I won't ever hear it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, then I'll, re, I'll receive like an email in the future, you know, like like four months later. It sounds great, you know. <laughs> or, yeah. You, you know, we, we won the contest tonight or something. And that's like, that's it. But <laughs> the drum corps, um, the troopers are the same way as, as Vanguard, where I'm, I'm not actually the music coordinator, but... Um, but it's, it's, it's almost, you know, we work, I work together with uh, Robert W. Smith, and I'll go to a design meeting with him and we'll we'll sort of sketch out the structure and even sometimes the choice of the tune. And then, uh, you know, we'll 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 set up a roadmap, a pretty serious thing that we stick to uh, in terms of form. And then I'll come home and Sandy and I will sit together and we'll we'll sort of map it out and then we'll work work separately. Um the more uh, it goes, I'm I'm trying. It's funny because you ask this, and I'm sort of analyzing what we do, and it's a little bit different every every time. But it's becoming more so that I stay up to all hours of the night, and she gets up at four forty five in the morning. And so we sort of last night we literally passed each other in the night. And uh, <laughs> as I was going to bed, she was getting up. Oh and, my gosh! Yeah, yeah, it's kind of rough these days. This this little period of time is not that. Not that great, but uh, <laughs> I, I remember also another period of time w that was not great was around tax time because your taxes were always a nightmare. <laughs> yeah, with all yeah. different things. <laughs> oh, I'm sure all of us could say the same thing, you know, True. being <laughs> half self-employed or whatever. You know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, funny. Yeah. Well, I could just keep rambling on. But... <laughs> well, 
I, I kind of wanted to take things in a different direction with this next question. But before I ask the question, I want to tell a story. So if anyone's not aware, Paul was one of my teachers at UNT. Um, and in fact, Paul and Mike Drake, I would say, were my top two <clears throat> favorite teachers that I wouldn't have survived the place without. Um, and I remember distinctly, I walked into my first snare drum lesson with Paul in my second semester. And he watched me play for about five minutes. And he just said, go home, memorize the first page of stick control. Don't come back if you don't have it memorized. <laughs> and that was the end of my first week. Uh, so there was a question from Michael Standard, and it said, how do you convince students of the importance of fundamentals? And I think that that was about all the convincing that I needed. And every single week I would come in and he would have me do something different with stick control. Um, but instead of asking that question, I wanted to ask Paul, could you just teach, could you just talk about overall your, uh, your sort of teaching philosophy, uh, I guess for snare drum, but percussion in general? Well, that's, that's a pretty loaded question. So I'll, I'll, I'll try to, I mean, that's a, that's an enormous question. What you're doing. <laughs> True. So I'll try to put it down a little bit. So get them down. I, you know, I think that a lot of times when you say that, I think that I'm, I'm, uh, my, my thought is I, I certainly hope I was nice about saying that. You, know? you weren't, but it's okay. I learned. <laughs> I, I try not to be. Um, I try to figure out how can I say this. I there's there's several things that uh, that I think about when I teach. So I could make an analogy to going to the doctor. And I think here's here's a mistake I think a lot of people make when they teach is they think that there are a certain set of rules that people can follow. And if you simply follow these rules, you're going to become a good player. So like you follow, you know, one, two, three, four, five, and then that will equal, you know, good playing. And I, I don't think about it that way at all. I think about it more like going to a doctor. And when you go to a doctor, he doesn't give you this, you know, he gives you a specific diagnosis for what you're in need of. And I think that's the same thing for a teacher. I mean, you have to size up the student, figure out what they need to hear, and then deliver that message to them. So if you're if you're a little bit set in your ways in terms of rules, you know, if you're going to say, like, you know, this, this recipe or this formula works for for everyone, that's really not true. I mean, not everyone's problem has the same thing. So a doctor can see somebody with the flu and he can see somebody with a broken leg. You know, you don't give the those two people the same medicine. You know, you don't give them the same information. And I think it's true for teaching, you know, probably teaching anything. So, you know, in music, we teach privately for most of what we do. Uh, and, and, you know, other than privately, it's usually in a small group. Then you can you can sort of individualize your comments and make sure that you understand that you're you're targeting certain problems. So there's three typical types of mistakes I think I, to be really general about it. There's there's the the first mistake which is uh, I don't understand you know I don't understand the rhythm I don't understand the uh, you know what the piece is asking me to do, and there's a you know that's an easy thing to teach. You just simply explain the rhythm, or you explain um, what they need to do in the piece. The second one is I understand what I'm supposed to do, but I don't have the facilities to do it. I don't have the hands to do it, and that's a really frustrating thing. As it, uh, for example, to teach snare drumming. Uh, you know, I teach concert snare drum, and if there's, let's say, somebody who's really focused and really uh, accomplished four mallet marimba player who who really is is completely focused in, um, you know, the 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 piston stroke and the wrist pops and and all that kind of stuff. I find that a lot of times there's a lot of frustration because they have pretty good ears and they can they can hear what they want to do, but they simply don't have the hands to do it. That's kind of the second mistake. And then the third mistake is is usually when you get more talented students um, is I'm not trying hard enough mistake. And you'd be surprised at how, how, how you can categorize a lot of these mistakes into those three places. So I don't understand it. I understand it, but I don't have the hands for it. And then I'm just simply not trying hard enough. I have the ears and the hands, and I'm just simply not making it happen. So I, I try to figure out which one of these things 
you know, is the case. And I think that I'll, I'll just say like two, two more brief things about it. I try to tap into the player's desire, which I think is a huge resource. If a, if a player, so in other words, if we're doing a jury piece, I typically ask them to pick and find their own jury pieces. I really, um, I really hesitate to assign them a jury piece. I don't tell them what to play. I don't give them a list. I make them find pieces. And so they have to look and they have to dig. And then uh, the only requirement is that they have to like the piece, right? And they yeah. have to, you know, they have to pick three pieces that they like. And then I get to choose one of those three pieces. So they're automatically trying to play something that taps into their desire and their, their, you know, their love for playing. And you can hear when somebody really loves a piece and you can hear when somebody is playing, uh, you know, like a standard piece, Delicus one or something, and they think they should play it, but they don't really like it. And so I try to tap into that desire level and try to stoke that fire to get them to, to learn what they like and then learn how to like, um, you know, a wider range of pieces. Um, so through, through, uh, through understand or through knowledge comes understanding and through understanding comes appreciation. So typically when somebody comes into school, they don't, they don't listen to Wagner or, you know, or, or, or list or something like that. But by the mm -hmm. time, the more they know, the more they become interested in it. And then, then the, the more they can appreciate more complex kinds of music. And so I just try to tap into that whole desire to learn the, the, the desire to, to really love what you do and to really want to do it. And I'll find out if you can, if you can stoke that fire, then a lot of that just blue collar work into music takes care of itself. They just love to do it and they find themselves mm -hmm. doing it more because they love the piece they're playing or they figured out how to, to, to love to practice or, you know, that, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff so that mm -hmm. it becomes um, like coaching, you know what I mean? Sort of coaching, yeah. and really learning how to do it. So what would have That's to awesome. be so wrong with a student's hands that you would tell them to go memorize the whole first page? Of <laughs> like how, how bad of chomps. It was bad, you guys. It was bad. <laughs> how I'm not, you know what? I, I did, you know, sometimes it's probably uh, a, <laughs> <laughs> trying to figure out, you know what? It I don't know if it's like that where the where you guys teach, but um, people in, in around this area learn how to read music so early, and they learn how to. Um, and this is probably going to solicit a bunch of hate mail for you guys or whatever. It, it, hopefully, I won't say anything too controversial. <laughs> Dude, but it's okay. We don't get mail. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all our mom, all our moms watch this. That's about it. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in terms of like if a student comes in and they're a really strong reader and they've learned how to play music from the very first moment learning how to read i find that it's not that uncommon to have some sort of a disconnect to the music i learned in a very unique way i learned by rote i learned how to play before i could read music i learned okay. to play drum set and i played drum set for years, and that's all I played for years. And I learned standards. It was mainly in, a, in, an, in an era where I could book a quartet or a quintet. I played with members of the Philadelphia Jazz Quartet when I was 16 and 17, and uh, basically learned a bulk of what I know about music at that time. And uh, there was no reading. It didn't have anything to do with reading. And so there was a connection to the sound of the music. And so when I learned how to read and when I learned how to you know, be a little more academic about it, then I, I'll never forget this, learning learning a drum set book, I think it was a Marv Dahlgren book, and I, I played it, and I, I was, you know, drum set um, notation is a little confusing at times, you know, which one's the floor tom, and which one's, and, and so you have to sort of, you know, scrape your way through it, and I remember learning this, and I, it just, really, the light bulb went off, and I thought, oh, wow, that's that lick that I played when I was in 10th grade in my basement mm. and this is this is how it looks and so the sound of it then became associated to the notation so it was like a shorthand notation so that 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 notation reminded me how it was supposed to sound and i think sometimes i get students that come in and it's just a process like they read the note note per note per note and it's just like an automatic thing it's like a uh i don't know how to describe it it's sort of like they they're just 
the note is telling them what to do. They're that, not like that reminds me of uh, And so what I was probably trying to get at is internalizing and memorizing, getting rid of the reading and the music, and just solely thinking about the sound of what you're doing and the and the the technique of doing it, uh, and associate it to what it should sound like. Instead of having a note tell you what to do, it just it's in my opinion it should sort of remind you what it should sound like. So. I thought the the perfect example of that was I remember you had one of the Pratt uh, solos and you wrote it out in proper notation. <laughs> Like, because he uses shorthand with drags and rolls and things like that, and you put it up, and you were like, "This is this is what you're playing," but it's it's terrible. Like you're just playing the ink. You need to play like you know what's behind this. Yeah, you know, I I mean it's I, I've gotten in long discussions about reading with people in committees and at uh, at PAS meetings, and and I'm I'm certainly like obviously I'm an academic kind of guy in terms of music i am not against reading i just think there has to be like ear training for a percussionist is a little different i think than other people and i i just think that you know ultimately it's just simply a way to remind you of what something should really sound like and i learned through a tradition of, of playing by rote and i just i just find an enormous value in it i think it's you know it's 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 an important thing to connect you to the sound of the music rather than to have this the shield of, of just reading and you know obviously if you can read really well and be connected to music that's ultimately where you want to be you know right. but I, I think that there's a there's a big difference between somebody who reads stick control and, and reads the r's and l's right and just like right left left right right then somebody who gets it and gets the 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 concept of moving in between notes and the returning back to the, you know, to the, the central, the point of, of initiation of the stroke and, you know, the motion that connects the, the, the rhythms. I, I think that that's a little more complicated than just reading the R's and L's on the page. So anyway. definitely. Yeah. So you you're be obviously you're best known to a lot of people through the marching thing and stuff like that. But you also do a ton with concert percussion stuff and teaching and everything like that and coaching percussion ensembles and everything. So how how do you think doing all of that affects on the concert side of things? Really affects how you approach the marching percussion ensemble from both an arranging and a technical standpoint and stuff. So I think that's a disconnect a lot. A lot of people have. So yeah, I mean, you're you're right. I'm I'm the marching guy, you know, when it comes to that stuff. But it's so funny because for years and years, I was not the marching guy at all. I I, right. I think I and this is gonna hopefully I won't sound pretentious, but I think that uh, some success has come because I wasn't born and bred out of the same. You know what I mean? It wasn't an incestuous sort of. I didn't learn simply through that 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 lens in other words i learned to play music you know like sitting down by rote with the guy you know playing drum set and learning how to play jazz i played uh i, I just dove into playing marimba became obsessive about that and then dove into playing uh was was a timpanist for a while really obsessed about that and then i i simply bring a lot of these things together and you know what the thing about the marching thing that is is attractive to me is i think that the the teaching environment is great you know and i kind of half joke to people and say you know at 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 school I, I can ask you to play really well, but in drum corps, I can make you play well. <laughs> you know, so, so it's like, I just like the environment. I think the intensity, the length of it, the the in-depthness of it, the, the level of detail, I mean, it becomes something that people take away from that experience and, and oftentimes become really successful. Um, you know, I can't think of, of a better training ground. Let's say if you're going to uh, audition for the Chicago Symphony, you know, the pressure involved in that. And I, I'll tell you, in the last 10 years, there is not a single note that these guys play in the summer that's not recorded digitally and put online within minutes of when they play it. And just like, um, you know, 
it critiqued online from you know from people from Japan and China and, and I mean it's just like you you don't play a single thing without like the wall of digital cameras mm-hmm. like and it, yeah. and there are pressure they're excessive <laughs> I I just think there's a pressure involved that's a great training ground you know and 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 some guys have had a have gone on to you know um land a lot of great jobs you know service jobs uh, graduate schools and Northwestern and Juilliard and, you know, um, and, and they've, I think the pressure of auditioning was certainly made easier by what we do in the summer. I think it's, it's a different thing. You know, I have to kind of mm-hmm. a lot, let, let a lot of things roll off me, like the critical comments, especially from older guys, they'll say, uh, you know, make sure you don't use those marching mallets on the keyboards. <laughs> right. And, uh, yeah. We, we hardly even play a xylophone without, like, a wrapped mallet, you know? Like, seriously, we, we never play with... We play with things that you would you would play in your professional ensemble. And we just mic it. Yeah. Tastely. I don't... We don't play in a way that is... Uh, would, I, I bet you... All of you would not think that what we do is, is uh, unusual or out of the ordinary. I mean, the way we play is kind of like the way the way I teach anybody how to play. We just do it all together, you know, oh, and, we, yeah. and, and, and the, the implements that we use and the instruments we play on, you know, are just tailored to, to playing outside, you know, or, or playing wherever we are. But we simply try, my, the, what I value is the same thing probably that, that any, you know, any trained musician values. And I, I, th- I think that I try to bring that to, to what I do. And I think that is universally appealing. I may be totally naive about that, but I think that's true. I think people hear something that is a quality thing and they're attracted to it, no matter what style of thing it is. I think for every snarky comment you get about, you know, two heart of mallets and breaking rosewood, you should poison one rosewood tree. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh! Um, I honestly, I I think Sandy would probably disagree with me a little bit, but I I am telling you this is absolutely the truthful. I cannot remember a single bar that we've broken. That's cool. Not a single bar. We have not broken any bars um, in terms of the way we play. Um, bars rarely get out of tune. The way we treat the instruments, we 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 rarely play anything that's metal in direct sunlight or anything that's hot. Uh, we play constantly play in in those kind of situations half volume. You know, we just we just treat it like uh like it's you know, like it's you know, how you treat your marimba. <laughs> you would never like you know, I, I just I think we just train our students to do that. They just they just play like um you know, like real professional musicians or musicians that are one step away from being pros. And I think that right now, the best, the most encouraging thing for me is, is just looking at the membership. Um, I would, I would say that it's probably exceeding 85 to 90% of college age music majors do this now in our, in, in our groups. I don't think there's, a, there wasn't a single person who played in our group that didn't have experience or didn't play. There was not one single person in the group that didn't do this before or, or, and I would say, I can't say for a fact, but almost literally almost every single person is a college age music major between the ages of 19 and 20, 22. And they, they have to go back and play a recital. You know, they have to go to your programs and go back and and do a recital. So it's in my interest to teach them in a way that they can do that. In other words, I would never want somebody to go to your programs and you have to sort of undo what they did. That would be awful. I would be, I would feel like we didn't really succeed. I feel like the guys that, you know, I, many, many of the, of the people that have been in the groups have become graduate students at really elite programs and have been like the the go-to guys that get things done and and you know work hard, don't complain, you know that kind of thing. That those kind of ethical things that that are taught through this sort of whole thing that we do. It's That's just like it's, it's just quirky. It's like the marching thing, 
you know it becomes kind of strange yeah it's a cult like things at times but we try to you know i just try to um make sure that those universally appealing musical things that we talk about like balance blend tastefulness you know like contrast all these basic musical concepts are, are really the only things that we talk about it's never like some weird school of thought well i know that's one of the things that like megan and i or that Laura, lauren and i talk a lot about here is that you know, because obviously she studied with you guys and everything is very close to you, um, is the whole thing. If we want to take all the qualifiers out of it, we just want to teach percussion. We don't want to teach marching marimba and all of that. We just want to teach marimba and teach yeah. snare drum and everything. So, Yeah, it's like supervised practice. Yeah. You know, it really is. It's sort of like we, we supervise how they... Uh, how they chop it out, how they get strength and control in a musical sort of way, and that's all supervised. We do that as a group, you know. And I think there's, it's kind of no better way. Like if you're a if you're a sophomore in college and you need to get your act together and get some, you know, get some hands together, there's nothing, there's hardly anything better. You're going to play for 10, 12 hours a day. You're going to be around your instrument for 10 to 12 hours a day. And you're going to be taught by people that are all professional, educated musicians. You know, I, th I think that's that's another thing that's really important is that, that you know the general lineage of of the school of thought in, in terms of teachers, it's all connected. You know, like people that I've taught are now teaching, and we all speak the same language. And and you would probably agree completely with what they're saying in terms of just the language that they use. Um, which is not always the case in marching percussion. I think that there's always that that disclaimer. You got to you got to admit. I mean, there's certain the athleticism of what it is sometimes takes over, and it becomes, um, you know, I don't know. Music becomes a little bit secondary in terms of just the way you play your instrument, and so we just try to reel it back in. Well, it seems like amplification has the advent of amplification in DCI has allowed what you're describing to be the case, which, and obviously lots of other factors, but um, I'm a Santa Clara Vanguard alumnus. And so, uh, and I marched right when one year without amplification and one year with amplification. No, that's wrong. Both were with, but when I started DCI, I was with the Colts and there was not amplification. And so it is super interesting, I think, to be involved at that time where you, you are using a different technique without the amplification. Um, I mean, of course, depending on, on the writing, but at least in my experience, the technique was different. And I think now, yeah, it's like a percussion ensemble. It can be like a concert percussion ensemble and makes it much more yeah, relevant to what we do in the concert percussion world or, you know, how you would play indoors as well. So I guess my question for you is how, um, like, what where, what direction do you see the Vanguard percussion section moving in? And I know DCI has been influenced a lot by WGI and the two worlds are starting to um, share a lot of the same members, a lot of students at least in my school are doing WGI and DCI so how do you see kind of WGI and DCI together changing the activity and where do you see Vanguard fitting into all of that <laughs> there was like five yeah. questions yeah, yeah. how much time do we have <laughs> yeah. you can just pick one just pick one <laughs> no I mean I, 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 the whole topic is so controversial I mean it's like yeah uh, it's, it's, it's funny because you, you can't be too critical or else you'll seem like really anti something, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I don't want to be too critical, but obviously I teach at the university of North Texas and we've, you know, essentially been at the, at the be very beginning of the indoor percussion thing, you know, going to PASIC for, you know, uh, you know, decades literally. And, and, and now it sort of has moved away because I think the, the, the WGI, phenomenon or the popularity of it is is unmistakable i mean if you can use that and and i always you know i i, I kind of always say this uh, to my kids and and 
at home and it's always like try to be a force for good don't be a force for evil you know mm. and i think it's it's important to remember that i mean it's such a powerful and popular thing that you have a responsibility in, in as a musician as somebody teaches at, uh, at the college level you you have a responsibility to teach in a way that applies to more things and applies to they can leave that experience and they apply what they've learned in other musical areas, right? And I think that yeah, sometimes sure. not everyone can say that. I, I think that it's it's uh, fundamentally a visually based activity. Winter Guard International is a visually driven activity, and sort of, um, you know, I think it, it can be easy for that that component of it to be overwhelming and to take over. You know, look at the, yeah. the costuming and the whole thing, and just just yeah, think. The, just think about the hours of rehearsal time, right? You know, if you have eight hours of rehearsal time and you're spending seven of them dealing with the visual component, the floor, the the costuming, the makeup, the whole, you know, like, I mean, it's then you leave yourself a little tiny sliver at the end to deal with the music. Yeah. That I, I I think that if. Um, once, once again, I think it, it's hard to say that and have everyone just sort of say, oh, you're you're against all this stuff. And I'm not. I'm just into people playing well. You know, I yeah. just like people play well. I'm and glad yeah. you brought this up. Cause I, I'm glad you brought this up because this was my question, too. And, of course, I've never been in DCI. I've never been WGI. But just talking with my students as they come back from it and their experiences and a conversation I had with a colleague and a student – and the student is really hyped up on all this theatrical stuff. And my colleague said, I said a, a, something I, I, I agree with uh, in, most, in most ways, I would say, which is it seems, it seems like it is becoming more about the theater than the music. And like you just said, if you're going to put that much energy into the theater, well, that energy has to come from somewhere. It could possibly be coming from the music being lost and of course i had no idea this was so controversial or even like a topic of discussion <laughs> until like just a little while ago but um mm-hmm. but i do have to say i mean i i have no problem with people adding theater to things where there wasn't theater before or adding music to things where there wasn't music before i mean i think it is a new art form and that means there's going to be these extra things. And of course you could apply the other thing that you just said, which was, well, if you're going to, te- if you're going to be a responsible teacher, you need to teach them things that are, uh, apply to multiple things. So you can make a case. Oh yeah. Introducing more theater does exactly that. So it's a really good idea, but I do have a problem with bad theater. <laughs> so yeah. and It's too right. bad. Laurel's not on the show right now because yeah. um, something she's talked about on the show before, when we talk about pieces like uh, Kegel or even uh, Mark Applebaum pieces or something like that, she'll talk about uh, a performance critique. So again, this is not a critique of the compositions, but of certain performances, but that's just false gesture, which is a, an, an mm-hmm. old, old theater thing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's, <laughs> when I look at some of these over dramatized things, I just, I just think like, oh, um, that's bad acting. <laughs> right, community yeah. theater kind of thing. I, I totally agree, and and I'm not being overly critical. You can hear by the tone of my voice that I am not being gratuitously critical of this at all. I am. I just mm-hmm. like to see people play great, and I think that you're exactly right. I think that sometimes, you know, I think they. They would be best served in terms of just that community would be best served if it wasn't so formulaic. If they didn't, if they themselves as, as members or arrangers or writers or creators, if they would feel like they could do literally whatever they wanted and they wouldn't have to subscribe to this list of 10 or 12 things that everyone has to do, I think it would just open it up and I think ultimately it would become a lot more interesting not that it's not interesting now, but I think it would, there would be such a wide variety of, of cool things that would happen. But right now, everyone, it's, it's, it's the price you pay for anything being competitive, right? I mean, it's like, it's kind of, um, it's naturally going to gravitate towards that. People are going to are going to sort of follow the lead. And then you're going to get like a dozen people doing roughly the same things, you know? the same sort of body moves, the same sort of, you know, like even rhythms become sort of trendy. 
you know, like certain rudiments become trendy. And it's like, that's because of the nature of the competitive thing. Be, you know, people follow what's leading. And it's just, it's, I wish it wasn't that way. You know, I wish people felt free enough to do whatever they wanted. And, and uh, so, you know, I, back in the day, the word trend was a bad thing. You remember that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like trend, yeah. trend didn't mean it, it. Now it's kind of a cool thing. You're trending or you're whatever. And it's like, that's true. It's a connotation. Right. It used to be when yeah. I went to school, it was not cool. <laughs> you were, if you were trendy, that was not a compliment. Mm. You know? So you wanted to be right. different or you want to come at it with a different angle. So, but I, and to answer your question about electronics and, and, uh, WGI and all that stuff. It, it, it is a fact of life. And I think Casey, you're exactly right. I try to encourage sort of a natural theatrical thing to it. So it doesn't seem contrived. In other words, you're not doing something just because you are making it up or, you know, something about the music tells you to do certain things in terms of movement and, and, uh, you know, staging or whatever. I think that if, if it comes across as a natural thing, then it seems more professional and it seems a little more polished. Uh, as far as amplification Megan, you, you wouldn't believe what it's like now. I mean, honestly, you, even in the last like six years, it yeah. has changed so radically that I've had to hire several guys. You know, there is a little team of people behind that whole thing because it becomes so outside of my comfort zone that I can't even, yeah. you know, I can't even deal with it. You know, it's like yeah. everything is is so complicated in terms of the technology behind what's going on it's you know, moving towards wireless microphones um yeah. we're, we're we're maxing out um incredibly large mixing boards where you literally can't put another thing into the mixing board and, and i think in 2015 i tried to make a really big statement uh, i had uh six dtx's and I mm -hmm. wanted to treat, and this is what was my take on electronics. I thought it would be really cool. As a percussionist, you know, it's typical if you have a xylophone, you also have a, a glockenspiel setup or, you know, some other things. You have a little mm -hmm. setup, but you're, you have a main keyboard, right? And then you have peripheral things around it. I thought it would be cool to have one of those peripheral things to be a DTX so mm -hmm. that every person in the back row could could access samples and trigger mm -hmm. their own thing and there was even parts where we wrote uh, keyboard parts in their left hand and they would play a a sampled sort of um you know modern sort of groove that was uh between two or three people so they play a mallet line and their other hand would be playing a sampled uh, dtx pad and uh you know honestly i thought it would get a lot more credit than it did <laughs> it really complicated yeah, and, and it was like trying to make the sampled electronic sounds accessible, like playing a glockenspiel would be for a, a, a xylophone player. You know, uh -huh. Having it be the same sort of accessibility to that. Right. But and I'll tell you what, it was so complicated. Yeah. It, yeah, it was like just the the snakes. You know, the the way it was wired, the everything everything about it was like a seriously complicated thing. And and we fortunately have. Uh, I met a guy named Lloyd Puckett from the Chicago area. Who's uh, he was a professional sound designer, and he worked with some heavyweights. And he can come in and work his magic, you know. Yeah. And, you know, it can sound awful, and I'd be pulling my hair out and just call up Lloyd. Lloyd, you know, please come out. Yeah. And you know, yeah. within an hour or two, he can sort of it all sounds great again. So you need that skill set. You do, I mean, it's, yeah. It's, it's a serious thing. I mean, well, you need marimba players to play marimba, snare drummers to play snare. You need electronic guys to deal totally. with. Totally, yeah. It and it's a lot to ask of it. And like, because I was, I was teaching in two thousand eight and nine at Boston Crusaders, and it was, I felt this responsibility you know i was like starting to read manuals and things because it's like if something goes wrong i you know okay i can't i can plug it all in but i can't troubleshoot i have to be able to troubleshoot because if yeah. something goes wrong there's no one to fix it but we had started yeah. at that point too to bring well tony nunez in a couple of times um just to kind of set everything up and make sure you know a couple of times throughout the year but it, it was it was stressful because yeah exactly i don't want to pretend to be someone who i'm not but right you feel like you're, it's, it's a responsibility. I think it was easy, uh, like say seven or eight years ago, 
for like yeah. a front ensemble tech or the teacher of the, the front ensemble, you just assume that they knew how to do all this. And I think right. now we're literally at the point where they just put their hands up and you say, cannot. Oh, it's, yeah. a spe- it's a special, it's better. <laughs> yeah. so we hire a guy, um, that goes on the road full time all year. And we have a backup for that, for him and another tech. And then we have a designer that I can literally describe the sound and he can make it happen. You know, I can I can literally like capture a sound that I want it to sound like, describe it in full detail and tell him exactly when, where, and how, you know, what rhythms and this, that, and then he will produce those sounds. Upload it on a USB drive, send it to us, you know, connect it to the DTX or, you know, program the synth sound and then it, it all happens that way. So the design process, it's still controlled somewhat in terms of from my perspective, but um, it, you have to let it go a little bit. And somebody who's a pro at designing those sounds has to has to follow through and, and kind of finish it out. And it's gotten so pervasive. I mean, even here at the university, we have to do that now. Um, we have we hire a sound tech. We've got guys that we hire to do the sound design and stuff. And that's for a college marching band. Yeah, it's just it's the way of the world at this point. Well, yeah, I mean, we hear all sorts of soundtracks, huh? And like you know, just recordings nowadays are just so complicated and so so layered. And we want what we do to sound the same way. And so everything has to be produced. I find myself wanting that produced ambient sound behind almost the whole production now so there are rarely moments where we'll be 100 percent acoustic now right there'll, there'll always be something behind it that makes it sound produced you know because blending the acoustic and the electric sounds is, is a little tricky i mean that that, that is the uh, you know we spend a lot of time dealing with that try to make it sound natural and like uh you know pads behind things and stuff like that to make it sound like it's just a natural part of this produced sound but uh yeah that's a headache and a half i have i have some gray hairs on that one you know, <laughs> just the cable that doesn't work or you know this just right at the wrong moment something all of a sudden you turn it on and it doesn't work it worked five minutes ago and, and you know so well- I have a I have a fun aside that I ran into actually I guess just two days ago, um, Megan. There's something that you share in common with the president, and I don't remember if I blew the surprise or not in the pre-talk. <laughs> I don't remember. You didn't. Oh, I didn't. Good. Okay. I so, don't think so. Yeah. So this is totally just a quick fun aside. So I'm listening to the news. I think I was actually uh, preparing uh, something for the podcast, and I just had news rolling, and I hear something about. Donald Trump's new microphone. So this report on his amazing new microphone and quote this is from the uh this is from the news report this changes decades of audio history. That's how they ended the little 5 minute segment. So they bring in this expert who's talking about presidential presentation and how they present themselves, stuff like the podium, things they choose to say, uh, s- stuff like that. And he says uh, D- Donald Trump has chosen to address the public in a very different way ever since he's taken office, starting with his microphone. So they show a picture of him from like the debates, and he's using like this type of microphone. Then they show him now as the president, he's using like that type of microphone. And they say, oh, this is so different. So that got me curious. And what bothered me was when they said this special microphone gives him an extra 20 dB, 21 dB increase and it's placed closer to his face, which means he's four times louder than anyone else, any other president thus far. <laughs> so that, of course, raised a red flag in my head because we all know that's not how it works. Like, no, the sound guy is going to just turn your gain down to compensate for proximity. <laughs> the speaker doesn't decide how loud they are. The point of view from the sound man and the audience does. And I was like, well, what is this microphone? What what is this magic microphone he's talking about? And some microphones do have a plus dB gain, but they're usually shotgun microphones to pick up a single person talking from really far away when you don't have the proper preamp to give it that boost. So I'm like, okay, yeah, what is the president's new microphone? It's a SM57. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so, so that's that's. that's I was like, um, there's 
going so with what's it. Cutting edge. About <laughs> well, yeah, it's a great mic. What's bothersome about this? And this is the same microphone Megan uses when she's in her office. She happens to not be there today, but when Megan's in her office, she's talking to us through an SM57, which is a great microphone. Um, but what, what's bothersome about this is not only the inaccuracy and in the information about the gain, but also the new microphone. It's not new. That's what they've been using since 1965, ever since Lyndon Johnson. Oh my god. So go go Matt. look up pictures of the presidents. You can see all of them are of course they're using different mics at different times. You'll you'll find pictures of them not using an SM57, but you can find everyone from Donald Trump back to uh just after Kennedy. Kennedy is when the SM57 does not appear. It's uh it's at Lyndon Johnson. So they're all using F SM57s, and sometimes they look a little different because they have a different wind sh windshield on them. And that's it. It's a, the same old thing. So I don't know. And, and the title of the the thing, uh, of the um, of the YouTube video from straight from MSNBC on their channel is Why President Donald Trump Uses a Different Microphone Than Past Presidents, the 11th Hour <laughs> MSNBC. Oh my God. So I don't know. I, I, I think I've discovered something about myself doing this podcast, which is I have a great <laughs> passion for disseminating just wrong information. <laughs> but it's just, <laughs> it's just amazing to me. Like, wait, this guy was on TV reporting this as an expert, promoting a book he wrote about this type of stuff. Wouldn't you just do a quick Google search to make sure you're <laughs> right about that? Is it's, it's insane. An, I don't know. That's I thought insane. it was funny. So anyway, I thought it's that was hilarious. Perfect. Yeah, you should um, you should I, find I, out I, how to contact him and send him the "Let me Google that for you" link. I oh, I, I know, literally right? I just I I didn't know what you guys were talking about, so I looked up the mic on Wikipedia, and there's actually a, a picture on Wikipedia of Barack Obama talking into that very microphone. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you can find everyone. So, <laughs> yeah. You now you can write a book find, with correct and, information. Well, and you can even find them talking into the same exact windshield one, like this giant one that makes his voice four times louder. It's just not true at all. It's just absolutely <laughs> silly. I like Ben's comment in the chat better. Donald oh, Trump also it. marched to SCB. <laughs> 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 Oh, it's hard to pay thank attention. Goodness you didn't. Politics. <laughs> it's hard when you're paying attention to the uh, when you're trying to work and the chat's going on. Ben, you can talk about <laughs> you can talk about somebody cool today. Why don't you do that and get me off of this nonsense? <laughs> yeah, That's sure. Nice case. So I was I was racking my brain trying to figure out what to talk about, and then like it hit me uh, that Paul's from Pennsylvania and Megan went to Eastman, so I should talk about Bob Becker. <laughs> Yay, Bob Becker. Bob Becker! Pennsylvania and went to Eastman. Um, and also, we just did his piece, Mudra, here with uh, a student of Paul's and a friend of mine named Akira. Um, so we'll talk about Mudra in a bit, and I'd love to hear Paul talk about Mudra. Um, and I've mentioned on the podcast before the Nexus blog, which is just a great wealth of information. And on Bob Becker's portion of the Nexus blog, just a month ago, he posted an interview with Greg Giannascoli, where I got a lot of information um, and definitely check that out and the rest of the Dexas blog. Um, but so anyway, Bob Becker was born June 22nd, 1947 in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And uh, he, as a child, his uncle owned a furniture store and he went into his uncle's furniture store one day with his parents and his uncle had traded something for a marimba. And the marimba was sitting sort of in the corner, disassembled, and Bob was apparently fascinated by the geometry of the instrument. And his uncle saw him kind of fascinated by it and said, okay, you can take it home and have it. And his mom said that if he wanted to keep it, he had to take lessons. So he started studying, I think at seven years old, with James Betts in Allentown, Pennsylvania. And that was his only teacher until college. He started studying keyboard percussion, but also studied rudimental snare drum, piano, and music theory with him. Uh, and late in high school, he started to get interested in jazz as well. And he said he attended several clinics by Joe Morello, who I know has been a big influence on Paul's uh, technique as well. And he incorporated a lot of the Joe Morello ideas of efficiency and in technique into his keyboard playing, uh, much like Lee Howard Stevens. He decided late in high school he wanted to audition at the Eastman School of Music, where he did. He auditioned in person for William Street. Uh, and he said William Street... Audition sort of turned into a lesson, and that uh, 
was influential in his decision to go there. He studied at Eastman for two years with Bill Street, and then when Street retired is when John Beck was hired. So he studied his last two years with John Beck, as well as the two years during his master's degree at Eastman with John Beck. He also studied with William Chinstein for one summer, uh, I think it was after his freshman year, to work on orchestral snare drum technique. While at Eastman, he also studied composition with Warren Benson and Aldo Provenzano, and he was awarded the prestigious performance certificate from Eastman for his performance of the Creston Concertino for Marimbo with the Rochester Philharmonic. After graduating, he did four years of postgraduate study at Wesleyan University, where he studied the world music of India, African, and Indonesia. The thing that surprised me is Bob Becker, who's known as a xylophone virtuoso, didn't really study xylophone in college at all. He said he didn't even own a xylophone until I think it was 1972, several years after he'd graduated college. He did study a lot of marimba, including every single year he did a non-degree marimba recital, except for his freshman year. So his sophomore junior, senior, and both years of his master's degree, he did a marimba recital. And he said he was possibly the first Eastman student to perform with four mallets. Uh, much thanks to his Nexi, Nexus colleague, Bill Kahn, who was sort of a collector of George Hamilton Green materials, Becker managed to study Green without having actually ever met him. Since graduating, he has performed with the Nexus Percussion Ensemble since its conception in 1971. He's performed under the baton of Pablo Casals, Pierre Boulez, Seiji Ozawa, and MTT, as well as many others. He's been a soloist with Nexus with the New York Philharmonic, Boston Symphony, Chicago Symphony, and more. He's performed in Steve Reich and Musicians, in which he won a Grammy, and he's performed alongside Eastman classmate and legendary drummer Steve Gadd. He has a signature stick, mallets, and xylophone that he developed with Malatech, and he's developed signature cymbals with Sabian. He was a 1999 PAS Hall of Fame inductee with the rest of Nexus. And uh, I would say his most popular composition is Nexus, or sorry, his, uh, is Mudra, which, like I said, we just performed here. And for anyone not familiar with Mudra, it's a piece written for prepared snare drum with keyboard percussion quartet. And he basically applies all these Indian rhythmic idioms to uh, rudimental drumming. And there's a roaring bass drum part in Mudra that uh, I would have loved to hear this one time. Bob Becker played that with Alan Abel on bass drum. Ooh, awesome. And pretty killer to hear. Yeah. Um, so like I said, we just did it with uh, Akira Robles here. Paul, have you ever played Mudra? You know, I've taught it a bunch of times. I actually never performed it. Gotcha. <laughs> so, but I know it well. You know? Yeah, yeah. What's the costuming right, like in it, Ben? Is it cool? <laughs> <laughs> I think Akira wore black pants and uh, maybe a dark red shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Very demanding. But yeah, Bob it, Becker it, really is a legend. I mean, it's it's incredible that he's still such an active performer too. I can't believe. Yeah. Actually, just Bert was just saying that he subbed. He, uh, I guess Bill hurt his knee or something, um, and he subbed with Nexus a couple weeks ago. He was telling me, and he's just like, "Man, he's still got it. It's insane. The guy just yeah. his hands are insane." And and I mean, when we were talking with uh, Bev Johnson a couple weeks ago, she was talking about all the early Nexus recordings. They couldn't edit. That's like, right. We were just talking about this. All yeah. those things were just like one take, and he nailed it. So. Yeah, it's a, he's a, he's an incredible musician. He's just also, I mean, you guys have probably met him too. He's just like the nicest humble, person yeah. ever. So humble. It's so incredible that Nexus is still playing. I mean, they really are a legendary percussion ensemble. They started so much for us, and it's incredible that they're still together and making music. Like that's it's awesome. I got to play with Bob Victor. Oh. Really. Yeah, TCU. We played a. It was a. It was like an old school rudimental thing, and mm -hmm. uh, that's when I kind of really learned how much he 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 knows about like the older rudimental styles of playing. And um, it was uh, I can't remember the piece. It was called <laughs> "Away Without Leave" or something. Yeah, Away Without Leave. You know what I'm talking yeah. about. Mm -hmm. it, it's just yeah. like a quartet and yep. just straight ahead sort of. But it yeah. was cool playing with Bob on stage. It was. It was neat. That's awesome. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Had to interpret things, you know what I mean? Like you had yeah. to sort of figure out where to put it, you know, to make it sound like that stylistically correct. So it wasn't always like with the slide rule, you know what I mean? Was, have you ever, Yeah. Have, have any of you ever used the uh, his 
I think it's called Rudimental Arithmetic book. Yeah. 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 I, 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 I like that book a lot. I was going to like, ask if people like the Snare Drum it, book. But I've never opened it, yeah. It's way, it's way complex in the, I mean, he just, it, it, it's a very finely written, <laughs> dense description of a lot of those concepts you were talking about. Uh, but I, I love the exercises and the pieces. Yeah, I like I it. A, I said, a, next is Sorry. Has, a, has a piece, um, ah, blanking on the name of it. It's the one with the Raghavan is is in there as well. It's a portfolio, the portfolio for Snare Yeah, the Bob Becker one is Newthon. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, it's a, another sort of South Indian. Yeah, sort of proto mudra. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah he also has a piece. He has a piece called Palta, and there's a video of Nexus performing it with Steve Gadd. It's for drum set solo with percussion ensemble. And I did that last year at FAU, and we're going to do it next year uh, here at Tarleton with uh, Michael D'Angelo, who is a former student of Paul's as well. Yeah, um, yeah and it's it's cool, the Steve Gadd. I mean, it's just cool to see Nexus playing with Steve Gadd. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I think, Ben, thanks so much. That was great. I yeah, would- of course. I think, hey, I um, have to shout out one more, one more thing. I have to. Uh, Sandy couldn't make it tonight because of you know the the day we had, but uh, you know I have to have to really go out and and say uh, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if she wasn't doing it as well. I think that it's a. You mean raising three kids? <laughs> no, I, I mean just but like the whole drum corps thing and all that. I I just think that to have. Uh, that to have that sort of personal um, thing behind it all is what it's all about. I mean, I honestly, I don't know if I would would have kept doing it. And and, and she does. She's a masterful, um, especially especially a keyboard arranger. But she's just got a great musical sense and style. And we have like an open conversation um, pretty much the whole you know year round in terms of designing and talking about things and what we want it to sound like and what you know and it is such a great um dialogue and such a great um you know we're we're sounding boards you know that that make the whole collaboration thing is just really um really outstanding it's like the most fun part about it honestly i think is um you know i'll I'll, i kind of you know, obviously, I know how she plays and how she thinks, and and uh, sort of try to try to carve out moments in the show uh, that that uh, I just like hand it and say, "You need to do your thing." You know, make it sound really beautiful. And I think probably one of the pinnacle moments was 2013. If you ever heard the the Les Mis show, she did. Uh, I remember we went and saw the movie. Cause we felt obligated <laughs> to see the movie. It was like, okay, the movie came out that year and we were playing it and I guess we got to go see the movie, you know? And so I saw the movie and there was a, 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 a piece called castle on the cloud that was um, in the movie that I just, I thought it would be absolutely perfect. So it's a keyboard moment, you know, it was, and, and so I included it in the show and just sort of said, Here's here's a chunk of time, you know. We take take as much as you want and make it as the prettiest thing you've ever heard, you know. And it was just a primarily a marimba, um, just, just I, I just think it was absolutely on another level, you know, honestly. And I think that, you know, I I feel um, that that relationship in terms of just not not personally but just professionally as well is is such a, a pleasure all the time it's great we never we never really argue about anything in terms of music and you know, i try to i try to lay out some parameters and and uh you know we're constantly throwing ideas back and forth you know i actually tricked her into writing music when i first met her i taught her how to use finale <laughs> <laughs> I, I basically said yeah, it's easy. Yeah, it's, it's like a game, you know, like five's the quarter note, four is the eighth <laughs> note. Yeah. She, she goes, oh, okay. And uh, before, you know, it's just learning. You know, it was really funny. It was like, <laughs> taught, her, taught her how to use finale. And now, you know, cool. she's she's doing her thing. You know, it sounds great. That's what so. finale's known for, is being really easy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say, like, building relationships. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we have our, we've been, uh, We've got some finale chops, definitely, but she's 
you know, if I've got a problem, I ask her and vice versa. So I've been making all these well, graphic scores in finale lately and I share them on Facebook and people say, how the hell did you do that? And I say finale and they go, what? No, you didn't. Come on. But I did. I tr- you know, I tried to teach myself how to use Sibelius. I teach a course at UNT uh, arranging and composition for percussion, you know, and it's like a one semester uh, course every other year for mainly for graduate students. But uh, I, I, you know, in the past, I brought in the Sibelius guy, you know, like literally he came there and did a presentation and I actually had him stay around and teach me. I just it, it was sort of like the language I learned was finale and I can't I, I you know, I kind of stopped fighting it. I, I'm a finale guy. I, I just can't. I'm a finale guy. Yeah, I just think that way now. And, you know, I used yeah, to I, it took me for a long time to stop writing with a pencil. But now, mm. now I use Sibelius and I can't speak Finale. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's funny. I have found too. people like that. It's, it's like one or the other. And it's just, I don't know. You know, I, I think it depends on the first one you use, I think. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, guys, thank you so much for doing a late night recording. And thanks so much to those of you who asked questions. We had questions from Jade Hales, Michael Stanford, Kramer Smith, and Don Miller this week. And I think we actually did cover everything everything in there. So yeah, thank you so much for your questions. Keep keep sending us your questions. Sometimes they they make the content of the whole show. So we we really appreciate it. And that means I don't have to prepare anything. It's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Paul, it's so great to see you. Yeah. I saw you Good to see you shared a clinic in Utah. I don't know, five years ago or something. And yeah. yeah, we met briefly, but you gave a great clinic and it was really cool. A lot of that has stuck with me over, even over the, the years. So yeah, thanks so much for joining Thank us. You. Great to see you too. Awesome. Yeah, you're, you're welcome. And Ben, Tracy, and let's see if I can get, oh yeah. Ben, thank you. Tracy, thank you. And... <laughs> <laughs> You need like you need like the rim shot symbol. <laughs> it's this crappy little it's this crappy oh, little thing I found God. on YouTube. It's like yeah, you gotta it. send it to me. I got I got I got to take it with me to Rochester. It's, it's <laughs> her new ringtone for you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> oh man. All right, thank guys. You. Thank you so much. We'll catch.